So, hey, I'd love to introduce our amazing guest today, Andrea. I'm going to mess up your name. So I'm going to say Andrea Giuzzuni, but I messed it up, right? It's it's <laughs> almost perfect. Uh, almost Jack. perfect? It's almost so, perfect. So, Andrea, I'd love for you to just give a little bit of color about what you do currently at E&Y and a little backdrop in terms of your experiences and your background and things that you're passionate about doing. Yeah, with pleasure, Jack. So I'm 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 Italian, 54, and I I, I have a degree in economics, uh, and I started with uh, Ernest and Young, uh, how it was called at the time, EY now, uh, when I was 25. So it's, it's been a, quite a journey, uh, almost 30 years uh, with the firm, and uh, I started uh, as a as a young auditor in a very small office. Uh, um, near Modena, where the Ferrari are built. And uh, I, I spent a couple of years in the audit department. I moved to London uh, in the late 90s, uh, and I joined the corporate finance department, uh, doing uh, uh, a lot of sexy stuff, evaluation, due diligence, uh, m and in general. And uh, I, I fell in love with the job, uh, and uh, I really uh, uh, never left it. I mean, I, I've been with, um, with the firm uh, um, in this uh, department called uh, Strategy and Transaction uh, for uh, the, the last 20 plus years. And I, I served uh, as a consultant, uh, a variety of different clients, private equity, um, corporates, uh, in a variety of different industries uh, and uh, in a variety of different countries, actually. So that's a bit of my journey. And in the last um, couple of years, uh, since 2010, I... I started really um, acting as a manager for the firm. This is a big firm. Uh, um, our revenues are um, in excess of um, $50 billion. Uh, so I now represent one of the four uh, divisions or service lines, as we call it, um, which deals really with um, strategy, deals, transactions, uh, transformation, and these kind of things. So that must be really exciting for, let's say, with deal flow in terms of mergers and acquisitions, M&A and then IPOs. Those are kind of sexy parts of the market. Now, to help the audience, and really for me and Rick to understand too, like how does that work? Are you are you kind of the corporate whisperer talking to these CEOs, advising what to do? How does this go up behind the scenes when there's a yeah. when there's this big transaction going on? Yeah, we do. We do all that. I mean, uh, we, we really have a, um, different roles depending on the different situations. Uh, we do really uh, bring in front of our clients, private equity corporates, deal ideas. Uh, we generate ideas uh, and we really look into their uh, strategies to try to find uh, um, the right opportunities uh, to grow, to really to, to do uh, more with their capital. But we also execute upon deals. So we perform uh, all those uh, technical things that are really relevant to execute upon uh, a complex deal, maybe a cross-border deal involving uh, um, dozens of different countries. Uh, so we look at uh, the investments uh, from a variety of perspectives. We have specialists who are looking into um, every sort of dimensions, valuation, uh, accounting, tax, uh, legal aspects, commercial aspects, uh, integration, and tech, obviously, IT, uh, integration of systems, rationalization, and then post-deal integration how we actually create value by merging entities. Or conversely, how we actually create value by allowing our companies to become uh, leaner and meaner, so divestment, spins, and these kind of things. So we do a bit of both. It's really the uh, front-end uh, strategic uh, um, whisperers, as you, as you define it. Um, but also, really, um, we go in-depth into the execution end to end to ensure that uh, what we have whispered actually finds uh, its realization in terms of value creation. Rick, that's pretty cool, right? That seems like, that sounds like a fun job, no? <laughs> it's a lot of hard work uh, and a lot of different people with different skills working together across the board, uh, different time zones. Uh, with the same technology, looking into a lot of data facts uh, and making sense of all this. Uh, it's a super multidisciplinary uh, effort, uh, which actually, from an intellectual point of view, it's super stimulating. Now, 
I admittedly don't have that finance background. And so when I hear these terms, I, I get a little intimidated, to be quite candid. You know, how does someone rise through the ranks at EY and get that, you know, capital markets transactions experience? Um, you know, does someone mentor you? Do you have to, you know, take a crash course? Do you have to have an economics or a business degree to be able to have that foundational knowledge to get into this line of work? It's a very good question, uh, Rick. I, I think that all, all of us um, obviously has um, um, some, some very strong background in some of the domains that are relevant uh, for something like that. So, for example, I have a, a, a background in economics, uh, but we have a lot of uh, engineers. We have people uh, coming from, uh, from uh, tax background uh, and uh, operations, etc. But the beauty of these firms is actually that you, during your career, you train and you are exposed to a variety of different competencies and skills. So you, you, you need to know really a lot uh, of the things that are relevant, but you tend to be proficient and very vertical in only a few. So you can really participate in a broader discussion with different uh, people at the table with different perspective, understanding them all, and also knowing what you don't know. And but enough really to understand that you need uh, the help of other people and and generally you develop uh, a lot of um, tech expertise you need really to understand uh, how to harness data and technology now we have uh, uh, the, the, the 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 lack of having uh, a lot of uh, ai support for our analysis which actually um, can bring to life a lot of new insights uh, and uh, coupled with uh, our sector expertise, uh, you come up with a lot of uh, new things, new ideas, new opportunities that uh, only five years ago were unthinkable. So that's really the sort of uh, continuous education you have to, to go through when you are in these sort of uh, large firms. And EY, it's a, it's a fantastic school in this respect because uh, uh, we are probably the, the the, the the most integrated globally firm uh, i mean so it's it's really a, a multicultural experience as well so you get to know people coming from uh, and different geographies different cultures uh, it enriches you also as a human being a lot Andre, just to kind of visualize this so let's say there's an m a transaction or an ipo transaction that you're advising can you kind of set the stage of like what that looks like? Because I imagine in, in my mind, like maybe it's this war room type of situation where everybody is in this big boardroom and you, you know, you're trying to make this IPO go or this deal get done. Can you give like pull back the curtain and let like, what is it like to be, for instance, Reddit just went public, right? So, okay. What, what is it like if that happens or, you know, um, BlackRock just took over some, you know, REIT, you know, and, and these are billion dollar deals. What's it like? Is this a huge adrenaline rush? Can, can you walk us through how you feel and what people are doing? Yeah, it's uh, it, it's interesting uh, because uh, generally uh, you, <laughs> you have uh, a very slow start in these kind of things. Uh, so a lot of these uh, big deals uh, actually are designed uh, behind the scenes for uh, for several months, sometimes years, uh, due to the complexity inherent in this situation. Uh, I mean, it takes a lot of uh, uh, undercover work to ensure that when you are really uh, kick off uh, the real project, uh, you have enough elements uh, um, to really consider the likelihood of a, a successful transaction and you start and when you, off you go, I mean, obviously you have um, a lot of project management, so it's not particularly sexy, it's hard work, uh, it's really plumbing over uh, poetry, I mean, you have a lot of data to crunch, uh, a lot of documents uh, actually to prepare, and a lot of analysis and, and, and to, to ensure that uh, all the different uh, multifaceted elements of a deal are covered uh, from a risk perspective, valuation perspective, so different teams working in parallel on different work streams. And then 
uh, towards the end of the process, uh, yes, Jack, the adrenaline uh, um, <laughs> goes up, and uh, because uh, you have uh, actually deadlines, so there are best of presentations, uh, and you have all the stakeholders, board presentation, board meetings, uh, and obviously you cannot make mistakes. I mean, every word counts, uh, and uh, to, in today's world, uh, I mean, the way in which you actually explain the narrative, uh, the, the the rationale underlying every transaction makes a huge difference so it's really quantitative but it's also qualitative it takes uh, a lot of uh, thinking as to how you present the case uh, to the internal stakeholders uh, and to the external investors uh, and then obviously uh, you reach your uh, your peak when um, you go really public and the day comes and uh, the documents are signed and uh, and again uh, it's uh, incredibly rewarding generally it's uh, uh, the result of months and months of hard work and teamwork uh, with, uh, and I mean, guys, I mean, you can imagine, I mean, not always uh, a smooth uh, uh, path. I mean, there are a lot of issues, uh, things that don't go in the right directions uh, and uh, and mistakes and uh, and corrections. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's a bit of, um, I mean, it's a bit of a journey. Every single large project tend to really absorb uh, <laughs> an incredible amount of energies, uh, both emotional energies and intellectual energies. It's, uh, two points here. It seems like there's a, a, a kind of a cliche-ish for, let's say, police officers or firefighters, where it's it's lots of downtime. You know, you're doing your work. It's, you know, just just kind of flatlining a little bit. But then all of a sudden, boom, everything changes really quickly. It plays up, like, yes, and absolutely. Then, right? And then everybody is on. And speaking of that, what kind of people, let's say, on your team, it doesn't have to be specific you or your team, but generally speaking, what do you look for in people who might say, oh my God, this sounds really cool. I would love to be involved in this space. What kind of backgrounds do you look for? What kind of people, what skills do they need to have? That you would say yes this person would be great to be on our team i think this these these kind of professions uh the 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 people we have on our teams tend to have a lot in common uh, i mean first uh, and foremost is really the 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 intellectual curiosity they want really to learn uh, to know more about things how the world works uh, and uh, and this is really a fundamental aspect uh, because uh, you really need to uh, study a lot. I mean, this uh, is work, but uh, it's it's continuous learning and training uh, and uh, and looking at uh, different perspectives. So first and foremost, uh, there is this aspect of being uh, incredibly curious. The second uh, attribute uh, we look for, and it's obviously uh, you can really understand from what I've just said, is really the ability to work in team. So we need really people who can accept the different roles uh, in the different situations. Sometimes I lead, uh, other times uh, I'm led because there are people that are more proficient in the specific things. Uh, so it's really this uh, ability to be uh, team players and leaders when it's necessary that uh, tend to characterize uh, our professionals. Uh, and again, it's, uh, it's the human factor that counts. There's a third element, which is really um, being an extremely hard worker. So it's, I mean, you can see the pace of these projects, et cetera. It tends to require a lot of personal commitment, uh, um, which needs to be justified by the satisfaction you feel doing these kind of things. So compared to the 80s, 90s, uh, where actually um, those working in, uh, in these uh, um, uh, line of business, uh, I mean, in particular in investment banking uh, and, and transaction in general. I think we used to work really crazy hours. Now the environment has changed significantly, but it remains a very demanding uh, uh, occupation. Uh, and with uh, all the possibility to work uh, from home, I mean, uh, we have some relief, obviously, because you have uh, the possibility to travel less, to commute less. Nevertheless, travels uh, and the possibility to spend uh, um, valuable time, uh, physical meetings, uh, meaning the logistics can be complicated. Uh, it's it's demanding for our professionals. So it's, it's not a job that uh, is for everyone also in terms of uh, work-life balance. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's harder than other, than other professions. I, mean, I wanna dive into something that you mentioned that 
the work isn't just done when the IPO or the acquisition or the merger happens. You mentioned a little bit um, about, you know, like these post-deal integrations and how you still continue to advise these boards and executives, you know, after the so-called event happens. Um, can you walk us through that? Because, you know, you mentioned that you bring in engineers to help with the technology, uh, adopting new systems, you know, like, are, are, are you just in the middle and putting people together and bringing folks together? Or, you know, how does that part of the equation work out after the event? It's a super important part of the equation, Rick, and this is what really clients uh, uh, want more and more because, uh, I mean, trying really to design a deal and, uh, and only being responsible for the execution of the transaction element of this, uh, and that, that was really more in the 80s and 90s. Uh, I think over the last <laughs> couple of years, uh, and I think legitimately so, I mean, our clients really want to... Um, ensure that uh, whatever is uh, the initial design that can actually be translated into effective execution and the value that we envisaged uh, at the beginning uh, can actually be transformed into actual return for the investor so value creation in uh, in technical terms so more and more uh, we are asked and we are actually are uh, equipped to uh, talk about uh, a potential deal uh, from the very outset, uh, looking into the operationalization of the post-deal uh, environment. Uh, and you can only do this if you uh, have at the table uh, the actual people who will be in charge of the post-deal uh, value realization, because they will commit to delivering, to help our clients uh, uh, deliver that value. And they will also uh, advise regarding uh, all the specific aspects that need to be dealt with uh, ahead of the deal to ensure that we maximize the likelihood of getting the most out of a transaction, which per se are very expensive things. You can imagine uh, the amount of time that the, the, the management has to spend really to get these things right, very strategic, uh, huge amount of capital, so huge amount of time dedicated to this, and then the, the, the real actual cost related to the transaction, bankers, lawyers, uh, consultants, and so on and so forth. So you need really to get uh, the value you have in mind uh, delivered at a certain point. So when the deal actually is executed, the transaction is completed, uh, the, the real uh, life starts uh, because you have really to ensure that all the assumptions you made, uh, all the plans uh, you had uh, can actually be executed. So the more realistic, the more grounded uh, these plans were and uh, the, the higher the likelihood that actually the value can be realized within the timeline expected for this. And again, the human factor prevails. Uh, you need to have the right people uh, with the right knowledge uh, of the different cultures, especially when you merge two businesses, uh, the cultural aspects become of fundamental importance. But you need to have people very, very vertical in specific fields. Uh, you mentioned uh, IT, and I mean, you need to, to have people who understand very well how to connect different environments uh, and do this uh, in a very uh, safe manner. I mean, today, cybersecurity and these kind of things of paramount importance uh, and the confidentiality, it's, it's key, especially if you're uh, talking about uh, listed companies uh, where actually stock prices can be affected uh, by leakages, etc. So all these aspects become incredibly important also in the post-deal situation. And these projects uh, can take uh, actually several years uh, to, to be um, finalized. It's, it's a long-term stuff because you need really to reorganize uh, business lines, uh, move uh, companies. Uh, um, sometimes you need really to um, change quite completely the business processes uh, that were present in the target company because they need to be realigned more effectively to the, the acquirers one. So it's super complex, uh, but that's really 
the, the most value adding part of the equation because just buying an asset, I mean, it may, it may be sexy for, uh, for certain investor who can actually speculate on, uh, on, on the, the swings in share prices uh, and uh, the week before or the week afterwards. But the, the real point is really the value that you create over time buying by really merging these two different entities uh, and and building something that uh, um, should uh, attract a much higher value in the long term yeah now andrea andrea you deal with a lot of ceos what's keeping them up at night is there a common thread you mentioned cybersecurity, ai are there other things that you notice it's front and center on ceos that are worried about you know War in the Middle East, war in the Ukraine, supply chain disruptions, AI. Are these things, you know, really weighing on them? Or are there other things too that aren't talked about enough that CEOs are concerned about what's going on? All, all of all of the above. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's uh, I would I would start really with um with the the, the geopolitical situation. Probably it's uh is the one item that is on top of every CEO's agenda. And uh, as you um, understand very well, uh, I think the last couple of years uh, um, have actually uh, shown how, how fragile um, our uh, uh, geopolitical framework was uh, in, uh, in the past two decades. Uh, and, uh, and some of the, of the cogs that now we see are in motion I mean, we're, we're not standing still even 10 years ago, and now they are moving very, very fast. And, um, and the implication of uh, uh, the current geopolitical situation uh, um, is, is massive uh, across uh, basically every, every business, uh, across uh, every country. And I think this is really the, um, the, 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 the single topic that uh, I would say keep uh, every CEO's um up at night because uh, again uh, it's uh, it's not just uh, um a single factor but uh, it's uh, it's a combination of things uh, um the 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 various scenarios that uh, need to be run uh, in this uh, current environment are super complex and um, so in two years time or in two months time um you can get from the uh, the current situation to a um, sort of um, um cold war two type of situation where actually there are two blocks and the trading uh, um, between these two blocks uh, is um, becoming uh, non-existent, so a completely different scenario. Um, Ten years ago, we were in a sort of globalization mode. Um, maybe in uh, in six months, we are in a completely different scenario where uh, um, friends come first, uh, and actually you organize uh, your business uh, only amongst companies and in particular in uh, in countries uh, where you think that um, the uh, the geopolitical environment uh, is uh, is more stable so this all this uh, has profound implications in the way in which uh, uh, you actually want to distribute your supply chain and the way in which you actually want to secure uh, all the um, the raw materials you need, the talent you need, the capital you need. You see all the implication across uh, all the dimension of um, of, a, on a, of an enterprise, and uh, and again, uh, the, the the landscape can change very fast, as we learned over the last couple of years. Uh, so CEOs need really to plan for this, uh, and uh, need really to prepare to build the resilience. Uh, uh, into their business models, uh, which comes as a price. Uh, it comes with uh, the cost of uh, uh, additional burdens. Uh, I mean, you need to have redundant uh, supply chains. So you need to have plan Bs. You need to have uh, reserves. So you cannot uh, have the same lean and mean uh, uh, organization you used to have probably in the early 2000s when actually we were in a completely different uh, setup. So this, uh, again, the, the geopolitical situation is probably the single item that is impacting the most, I think, uh, the, the agenda of uh, corporates and private, uh, private equity as well. Now, I, I wonder, 
beyond the you know actual financial events of the transaction what other you know things do CEOs bring you in on to uh, kind of consult and advise in terms of how they can succeed as a business I think we 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 look into uh, all the strategic aspects of a business obviously I mean our our scope uh, is uh, is super broad I mean what we 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 do in, in the most strategic part of our offering is really how we reimagine uh, businesses looking uh, at the the possibilities of the of the digital world so what we call the enterprise reimagine how we actually um, start from the existing assets and we reimagine a, a, a business uh, looking at the technology that is available uh, looking at the different uh, setup uh, of the existing processes uh, and giving really the the, the possibility for uh, for our clients uh, to monetize uh, on assets that currently are uh, are standing idle and and really reaching a much broader customer base uh, both uh, geographically and uh, in terms of uh, um, different categories of, of customers and and extracting value from um, from products uh, and that uh, are probably undersold today. So this that's part uh, of the of the transformation journey is probably um, probably uh, even more interesting than the M and A one in many respects. And uh, generally, they tend to go hand in hand actually. And it's really how we transform uh, a traditional analog uh, business uh, into something that. Uh, uh, can reach its full potential by exploiting uh, and the advancement in technology. And uh, again, it's cloud, uh, it's AI, it's blockchain, uh, it's all these um, these additional things uh, uh, that coupled with uh, the ingenuity and creativity of the human beings can actually give rise to a huge amount of value that can be unleashed. And actually our... Uh, um, the corporate world uh, is still in the middle of this journey. I mean, some enterprises uh, have already started this journey. A few have almost completed this, uh, but uh, the vast majority are still in the middle. So there's a huge uh, uh, runway for, uh, for our economies to become more productive, more efficient, uh, and actually more work for us as consulting, uh, trying really to uh, disseminate the knowledge that we accumulate uh, as we we advise uh, companies in different sectors. You mentioned AI. Yeah. What, where, where do you see it fitting in within your practice and, and just E and Y in general? Is this something that you're you know, adopting really quickly and making life easier when you're doing you know, an MA deal or an IPO or any other financial traction, transactions, or, or you're kind of just feeling it out to see you know, what's, what's really going to go on? I think it's 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 very interesting the fact that uh, this technology, um, despite the fact that uh, has been around for uh, decades probably, um, has matured over the last uh, let's say twenty four months uh, um, incredibly fast. So there has been really breakthroughs, uh, and these uh, uh, advancements uh, have led to an incredibly fast adoption. And um, so there are a lot of uh, use cases now available. Uh, that are mainly focused uh, on uh, what we call the, the efficiency play. So how we do the same things that we used to do without that technology, faster, with more quality, with uh, uh, less labor. So basically uh, in a much modern manner. And these use cases are actually are um, quite uh, uh, useful across the board, uh, every industry, every profession. Obviously, the more you work in, a, let's say, intellectual field where you need really a lot of data and you need really to um, use a lot of information and analysis, uh, in particular qualitative stuff. I mean, this technology is a no brainer and uh, the rate of adoption is super fast. So for us, having the possibility really to use this technology to scan um, the web and all the databases to understand uh, what kind of uh, new targets could be suitable uh, for uh, 
uh, client of ours, uh, or really to produce uh, um, an entire insights report uh, in, uh, in five minutes instead of uh, five weeks, uh, and getting really reports uh, and, uh, and, and other documents, proposals, uh, and prepared 80% uh, ready in, uh, in a couple of minutes. I mean, this is a game changer for us as it is for, uh, for our customers. What is coming uh, as the, the, the technology um, further improves uh, is really um, the, 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 the passage from uh, an efficiency play to a uh, value creation, uh, top line uh, growth uh, uh, type of uh, uh, tool. And, and ultimately the, 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 the final stage, uh, uh, we can see, we can really predict this uh, technology becoming uh, a competitive advantage in terms of transforming the business processes and transforming really the businesses uh, um, still to come. I think that we, we, we need another couple of breakthroughs probably to get there, but the potential is there. That's why it's so uh, ranked, is, is ranked so high in, uh, in the corporate agenda. And uh, because they, they, they actually the businesses who can get uh, there first, uh, they can re really gain a competitive advantage uh, well beyond uh, the efficiencies uh, that are currently um, on top of everybody's agenda. And for us, I mean, for our industry, for the professional service industry, this is going to change quite significantly the shape of our workforce. Uh, we need probably more people uh, um, making sense of what uh, uh, this technology can generate for us uh, and probably less people uh, bored to death in some uh, very mundane uh, <laughs> exercises <laughs> that have always uh, characterized uh, the investment banking and the professional service industry. So I think it's going to be an evolution also the way in which we train our people, the way in which we, we use our people uh, to make the most uh, uh, out of this technology. It's very, very uh, exciting, I would say, for everybody. Now, Andrea, you have more than 20 years of experience in transactions. You know, over those 20 years, there's been so many different, you know, you mentioned technology trends, industry trends, but there's also been different business cycles and economic, you know, conditions. How has transactions, these M&A deals, these IPOs, um, these investments by these corporates, how have they changed over that time? I mean, the... the, the... The process uh, and the the process that, that leads to the execution of uh, of deals uh, and transactions in general has not really changed massively. I mean, obviously, they they and uh, there has been a lot of improvements, uh, and in particular when uh, we we moved from, uh, for example, um, uh, physical data rooms with uh, hundreds uh, uh, of files. Uh, and, and now virtual data rooms, and now we have AI really <laughs> scanning through all these documents. So that's changed. But at the end, uh, it's, it's a, an intellectual exercise aimed at uh, assessing all the aspects uh, of a potential target, uh, and even beforehand uh, at assessing all the potential targets uh, that can create value um, if combined with the acquirer. So I think that conceptually has not really changed much. The way in which the individual uh, stages of the process uh, um, are conducted, uh, actually they have changed a lot. And uh, especially after the, um, the pandemic, uh, um, I mean, the, the, the pros, uh, I would say, much less uh, uh, travels uh, and, uh, and logistics much more simplified by all these uh, virtual uh, possibilities and the use of... Uh, uh, video calls, uh, et cetera. Cons, uh, I think that um, one of the uh, most important uh, um, aspects of this job is really to have the possibility to meet physically with incredibly interesting people, managers, CEOs, uh, and uh, other uh, professionals, uh, and really establish uh, rapports, uh, relationships, uh, and, uh, and really working together, spending time together, uh, and, and building a network of different people with different cultures. Uh, I think in this new virtual world, we are missing a bit of that element, uh, which was uh, an incredible uh, uh, opportunity in particular for, uh, for the, the young professionals really to learn fast uh, and experience actually 
and the 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 the, the, the incredible uh, richness uh, of uh, of this professional world but the the rationale uh, around these these transactions uh, remains the same i mean it's uh, the, a deal uh, is the fastest way really to transform a business. Uh, you can do this very fast by buying instead of building. Building is much more complicated, less risky sometimes, but much more complicated. So it's the best way to boost growth, uh, to boost innovation. If you look at the, 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 the latest uh, CEO survey um, we have published, uh, which actually is out of the press, is, uh, is, uh, is being distributed as we speak. Uh, I mean, you see that uh, the, even, even in, in, uh, in April 24, one of the main drivers uh, uh, underneath uh, transaction and, uh, and the appeal of transaction is getting uh, more technology faster into and corporates, uh, new products, uh, new possibilities to grow uh, faster. And uh, I think CEOs and boards accept the risk uh, of doing these, uh, these massive investments uh, and because uh, it's, uh, it's a game changer. And, uh, and that's really the beauty of this. I mean, uh, uh, a lot at stake, but at the same time, uh, a huge reward uh, if executed properly. No, are there moments that you find that um, IPO transactions, these deals tick up? You know, you you mentioned that the need for these businesses, these executives, these boards to realize game changing impact and, or increase their scope, um, those are certainly catalysts. But are there any other kind of pivotal moments that you know either lead to an uptick or even a decrease in this kind of activity? Yeah, I think that the I would I would probably um, <clears throat> mention uh, again uh, um, some of the outcomes coming from uh, from our latest survey, which basically um, tells us uh, that uh, in the in, in the current environment, CEOs uh, are actually looking uh, increasingly at uh, divestments and spins uh, as a way of creating value. So large corporates uh, with a very diversified scope uh, and sometimes with uh, um, uh, subsidiaries and operations in countries, in geographies, uh, or operating in sectors uh, that uh, may become problematic in the long term due to all the changes we discussed before, geopolitical things, changing customer taste, technology aspects. Uh, and there's uh, this sort of willingness to do what we call the portfolio review. So really open up uh, all your assets, all your businesses, all your subsidiaries, all your revenue streams, and try to understand whether there's a better way to use the capital you have currently deployed. And generally, this means that, uh, um, yes, you would like to invest more in certain specific geographies or sectors or products, uh, but in order to do so, you need to simplify the model. You need to divest actually in other parts of the business because uh, the scenarios change or is going to change fast. So the investments uh, are becoming more and more at the top of the CEO's agenda because also capital is quite expensive today, especially more, more expense, expensive than it used to be until two years ago. So I think it, having the possibility to fund the new ventures uh, those who actually are going to give rise to uh, the future revenue streams by disposing of businesses that maybe are not bad, maybe are not uh, doing uh, um, particularly bad, but uh, they could be better in somebody else's hands, um, where probably the, their core business uh, is more aligned with, uh, with these, um, these service lines, these divisions, uh, that's becoming uh, of paramount importance for uh, for boards and investors and investor asking actually boards to look much more actively at these aspects as a way really to free up capital and redeploy it in a in a more effective manner when, when you talk about divesting is this similar to what GE just recently did where they spun off? I want to say their aeronomic, I can't remember if it's the healthcare or aeronomic, uh, something they spun off, right? Is that kind of what you're talking about? Where they That's feel like it's better off on its own than yes. staying with the parent company? Yes, as you look at uh, um, many, 
many uh, large American corporation, uh, G, and uh, you can look at J and J and others. They all been through mm -hmm. this sort of process. So the the, the 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 bigger the corporation, the more sophisticated uh, the business model, and the more likely that uh, they go through this sort of processes as a natural, ongoing uh, exercise to ensure that uh, the capital they are using. Uh, is uh, is getting the highest possible return. So you will see that uh, there is a trend over the last couple of years, and not just for for tax reason. I think there are also fiscal implications, uh, and that um, may may trigger some of these uh, spins. But uh, in general, it's really the sheer consideration that uh, a slimmer, uh, um, leaner organization can actually create more value. For the shareholders uh, than the conglomerate, and uh, and and this is it's a phenomenon that uh, tends to repeat uh, over time because uh, you tend to build uh, certain constructs, certain frameworks, certain organization based on uh, the foreseeable future and the existing uh, circumstances, and then uh, especially in uh, in the last couple of years, things change so quickly that all of a sudden you find that your footprint is not the the best one to face uh, the uncertainty of the future or the few certainties we have about the future. So you need really to um, to pivot to something different. And again, um, if uh, the, the acquisition is a very um, complicated exercise, it's more an art than a science in many respects, the investments are not easier because you have to take uh, I look at all the consideration regarding uh, the separations, the, 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 the transition period, uh, stranded asset, uh, um, transitional agreements. Uh, so the complexities regarding uh, um, a, a, a separation, a spin, uh, a divestment uh, tend to be probably even, <laughs> even bigger than an acquisition. And actually the value that you can destroy if you can, don't do this right uh, can be immense, in particular, you look at the, the disruption that you can cause to the division you 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 decide to spin off, uh, and uh, and all the obviously uh, social and uh, and and human factors that can mm -hmm. be somehow associated with this sort of separations. Uh, so it's complicated. So pulling together different cultures is complicated, but separating uh, people uh, who actually belong to the same uh, team, the same firm, the same culture is not is not an easy task either. That's just one last question. Um, I, and I don't know if this is in your field or fair to ask you, but I think most people are concerned about what, and you're, you come across very optimistic about everything. How do you feel about the economy? And let's say here in the US where we're like trillions of dollars in debt. So working at a company that has audit, accounting, tax, should we be worried, not worried? What do you think, will this all work out? Do you have any sense of how things will play out? I remind you, Jake, that you're talking to an Italian, and uh, we have a think about uh, 140 percent uh, GDP debt ratio. So it's it's well above uh, the US, uh, which is probably below 100 percent still. So I think that yes, it's uh, uh, it's very uncertain. Uh, the future, uh, um, in many respects, uh, looking in particular at. Uh, all the, the the different uh, situation of where for warfare we have uh, i mean may 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 look particularly bleak uh, but i think we should we should really resist uh, and we should uh, actually look at uh, um the 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 future prospects uh, taking into consideration uh, the fact that uh, uh, our economies uh, are still adapting to the post pandemic uh, um, word and uh, it's been a, a one-off uh, element. Uh, um, history uh, obviously is moving. Uh, I mean, there are different uh, um, blocks now. You see different uh, scenarios uh, and uh, and different uh, um, say center of powers uh, and and all this uh, it's it's part of uh, of a story that uh, is unfolding. Uh, but the, the, the fundamentals, uh, I think, remain very strong. I mean, the U.S. economy remains super strong. And they, if you look at uh, the, the, the state of the art, the technology in the U.S., uh, 
it's uh, it's 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 second to none. So I think the the dollar uh, remains uh, the the safe haven currency. Uh, whatever you can uh, you can say. I mean, it's uh, so. I think that if you look at the fundamentals uh, and if you look at uh, this process of adapting to a different reality that actually um, is happening fast and the impact of technology, etc. I mean, you should not be surprised that you have uh, all all these uh, hot spots uh, and all these additional uh, uh, elements of uncertainty and complexity. That's gonna be that's gonna be our future for sure. But uh, again, um, if you um, listen to what our CEOs are telling us, uh, um, just uh, 12 months ago, they were much more pessimistic mm -hmm. about the outlook. Uh, if you look at the current uh, uh, feedback, uh, they all feel actually much more optimistic and much more optimistic, not just about the global uh, uh, outlook, but also their ability to improve their revenues and improve their profitability. And this is because uh, I think they have come to terms with the fact that, 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 yes, there are aspects that are beyond their control and they need to live with this. Uh, they need really to have risk mitigation plans, et cetera. But there is a lot that they can do actually, even in this environment to boost growth, uh, to ensure that they cut costs and they, they preserve profitability. And they are doing exactly this. It's the usual balancing act between uh, ensuring that you improve in the short term and you satisfy your investors and the markets, uh, which actually is happening. Because if you look at uh, the stock markets, actually uh, leaving aside the last couple of weeks, uh, I mean, uh, there, there, there's been quite a, quite a good ride, I think, over the last year. Yeah. But at the same time, it means that we are delivering uh, as a corporate world uh, a lot. In the meantime, I think you need really to prepare and to invest uh, to face actually more long-term, more strategic issues, sustainability, technology, and resilience, uh, changes uh, in geopolitical landscape. So if you look at uh, how we are responding and reacting, uh, and even the IMF, I mean, are, are actually signaling that uh, the, the overall global situation is improving. So it's not a, a surprise that CEOs feel uh, uh, more confident now than 12 months ago. Now, um, we live obviously in an incredibly uncertain environment, in particular due to the, the state of warfare we have uh, in Europe and the Middle East and the tension in... Uh, so, I mean, there are obviously um, situations uh, that can change quite dramatically the current uh, uh, trajectory. But the current trajectory, I think it's much more reassuring today than it used to be 12 months ago, in my view. I feel much better. What about you, Rick? So that was I, that was good because I've been worried a little bit. You're right. The stock market has been doing really well, you know, traded, you know, a little bit of a correction. It's kind of inching up again. But I like I like that optimistic viewpoint of things. Sometimes, you know, you forget about that. You see, you focus on all the negatives happening and you need that injection of positivity and saying, hey, wait, things are looking good. Right, Rick? No, I, th I think that's exactly right. And I really appreciate this advice and this walkthrough into kind of what from an outsider's yeah. perspective seems to be quite each like complex and, 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 and difficult, um, you know, very dynamic situation. So thank you, Andrea, for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thank you, <laughs> thank you so much. It's great to see you again. See you soon. Take care.